Hello, Reverend Barber. Hey. Hey. <laughs> this is cool. <laughs> well, I'm cool, so you're cool. Right, so, right. <laughs> I'm, Look, so, I'm so glad to see you this evening. I, I'm glad to be with you. And you know, let me say, first of all, I am glad, number one, you, my sister, you hung in the White House uh, uh, um, uh, room with the press room. Despite of all the foolishness, you my shero all day long. You almost made me come up there and put oil all over that place. I had some special. You need to oil. put oil everywhere on every doorknob, on every podium, every in the Oval Office, on the carpet, <laughs> on the Eagles, everywhere, even Ever. on Dr. King's head that's yeah. in the Oval Office. Yes, we. I told, I told, I told uh, uh, President Elect Biden and Vice President Harris, let some of us preachers come up there and anoint the place before y'all go all in there. <laughs> we need to fumigate before we need to fumigate before there's an anointing, okay? <laughs> oh well, I'm telling you, I'm telling. But I, you really are one of the most dignified sisters. I'm not saying that because I'm on your show. You know, you were you were character and courage under fire, and I know the kind of fire you were taking. Not only inside, but the threats and all that stuff. You didn't ask me to say this, but I'm okay. thanking thanking you for the people you hung in there and continue to hang in there and never backed up on telling the truth. You know, that's 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 what we need. I. Said so we got our own modern day Ida B. Wells. So let me tell you, when I first met you, I was so humbled. Did we for you know when we first met at the at the King, um, the 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 commemoration of Dr. King's um, uh, death, assassination. That's right. At the Rain Motel, yeah. and you prophesied over me. You said you. I said. I mean, I was I was like, oh my God, this Reverend Barber, and it's like you know you're in news and you're not supposed to be a groupie, but I'm just like. I was born, I was only a few months old when Dr. King was killed. Mm -hmm. And I'm not that far removed from civil rights. And my parents used to always talk about it um, in my home. And then when you see someone who's bold, and especially in North Carolina, because my mom was from North Carolina, my late mother's from North Carolina. Oh, wow. What part? Very small part. My population, 200 people. It's called Sarah Gorda. It's in Columbus County, the southeastern tip. Oh, it's yeah. between, yes, yeah. it's between Wilmington and yeah. Lumberton. And Whiteville. Why? Well, yes, we used to go to town. <laughs> Whiteville Tavern, Fair Bluff. Oh, my God. I used to ride on the back of the trucks, going to the tobacco market. I used to put in tobacco on Saturdays yeah. Yeah. Um, in the pack house. I mean, I'm a little country girl going down up and down dirt roads with a stick. Um, yeah. But no, but you, when you spoke to me that night, you prophesied to me, because I'm going to tell you something, people don't realize, people don't know everyone's story, and everyone can't handle your truth. That's but right. For me, when you said, you know, you said not only, you, 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 you gave me the names out of the Bible, you said, you are so-and-so, you are so-and-so, because you speak the truth and you tell the people, I was like, okay. And you made me realize, you helped me understand more so that it's not about me. It's about the people. We the people. Actually, it, 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 I remember that day. It was downstairs in the museum. I was speaking that day um, on the 50th, on the anniversary. Uh, I was giving the last speech right at the top of the hour when he would have been assassinated. And when I came down, I saw you. I knew who you were. And you came over me prayed. And I said that you were Holda. She was the w woman when the nation was all messed up in the Bible. It was a woman named Holda who had to interpret the scriptures and interpret the time when the other people could not interpret. They couldn't even go in. They didn't know what was going in. And it was the prophetess Holder who read the Bible, who, re who, who basically gave the analysis of what was going on in Israel. And a lot of people don't know the story of Holder, but she was one serious sister. And if it hadn't been for her, people really wouldn't have known what was going on. Well, I'm going to tell you something. I thank you. And I, you know, it didn't, I don't think it took, um, and, and thank you for someone said April Ryan made a difference in the 2020 election. Thank you. I don't think, really, I don't think, but I thank you for that, for that analogy. I thank you for that prophetic word that you gave me. But I really, honestly, I'm humbled that you said that, but I don't really think it takes an interpreter to understand hate and racism and to call it out. Um, it know, takes the courage to do it. The thing about Holder, you see, she wasn't, so, as a woman in that space, it took a lot of courage to do what she did. And sometimes it does take a little courage. And I don't know if it takes it to interpret it, but it takes it to help people understand this is nothing to play with. You know, I can remember way before the other folk were t taking it serious 
And they were kind of saying, well, he'll change. What You were saying, uh-uh, I know this. I've seen this. This, this, I know what this is, and this is only going to get worse. And, and, you know, and, and I said, I was, it was me and Charles Blow. We were the that's first right. ones to that's publicly right. go out, like, look, y'all, something's wrong. And everybody said, well, that's what he's just saying, you know, just to get votes. Mm -mm. No, it got mm -hmm. worse. You know, yeah. as a man speaking, so is he. That's right. That's exactly right. And it got and you, worse. And it's and getting you know, worse. I was speaking paper before a group of um, union workers uh, after Trump got elected, <clears throat> white, uh, primarily white. And I said to them, because some of them had supported him and they were mad by the time I came to speak at this big gathering. And I said, I don't want to beat up on y'all, but I do want to help you understand something. Why did you ever think you could trust a racist with your jobs and with your economics? And, and I said, listen, I learned this before I went to seminary. My grandmother said, if you scratch a liar, you'll find a thief. So <laughs> racism is a lie. So if a person is stuck in racism, they're stuck in a lie, they live in a lie, they believe a lie, they promote a lie. So if they're a lie, they're steal. If they steal, they're cheat. <laughs> you know, that's what the old folk taught us. So I said, there's no, it, I said, I want y'all to understand, don't ever, try, and I said to mostly white men, don't ever think you can trust somebody who tells you they're against us, they're against Latino people, they're against indigenous people, but they're going to take care of your economics. They're going to take care of your job. And, and, you know, it was funny the other night, Dave Chappelle asked the question, what kind of person, what kind of man will, will be sick and take care of themselves and watch their own friends die? Woo! Preach that word, Reverend Barber. You know. If, 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 <laughs> if you guys don't know who we're talking to tonight, we are talking to Reverend William Barber, one of the national board members of the NAACP, and he is one of the co-chairs of the Poor People's Campaign, the new version. Um, mm -hmm. I am just so honored because you know, guys, he just got on IG for me. That's right. I know how to do this. I really <laughs> didn't. I, <laughs> I felt so bad last week when I thought, oh, Lord, let me figure out. So I got somebody to do it. But you know something, April, you just mentioned, going back to, to, to this situation. Um, you know, I was watching with Trump, and I don't want to say much about him because I want to talk about Biden and, and, and Kamala. And oh, we want to talk about it all. But, but, but we got to say a word about this because it's not just Trumpism. See, it's not just Trump. You know, I read a um, piece from eight, 1968 when Kevin Phillips and Buchanan went into Richard Nixon and they put a memo on his desk. The basis of the memo was called um, Positive Polarization. And there's a book by, by Jonathan Shell called The Illusion. And basically what Kevin Phillips and Buchanan said to Richard Nixon, here's how we can split the country for political expediency, but we must always deny it publicly. Here's the plan. And if we operate this plan, we can create the polarization that can give the illusion that the South is red. We will, we will suppress the vote. We will, we, will, we will cause the South to be low voting states, right? And we will give the illusion. And this illusion will last 50 some years. They said that in 1968. So it's important for us to know Trump, don't ever give him so much credit that he did this on his own. He played to an audience that had been cultivated for 58 years. 70 plus million people right. are turning a blind eye to hate, destruction, COVID, racism. Yep. Their 70 own million people. Yeah, their own lives. Their own lives. He keeps talking about the, the states that are the poorest and the sickest and without health insurance are quote unquote led by Republicans. Now, it shouldn't matter, but Mitch they're McConnell. Mitch right, McConnell. Right. Mitch McConnell. Appalachia. Appalachia. I've been up there. And a Mitch lot of the folks. people up there don't agree with that stuff. I'm going to tell you, a lot of the people in Appalachia, white folks, there's a new study that's going to come, well, it came out a few years ago, that's going to show how poor whites under $50,000 a year actually vote more for Biden and, uh, and Hillary and, 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 and voted for Harris than they did for Trump. But the volume is low. It's those, it's, 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 it's that, that the poor and low wealth people actually tend to vote more progressive when they vote. And we got some jobs. studies coming out about that. The least yeah. of these. And, and it kind of goes to, it kind of, because oh. it's unfortunate that the Democratic Party is viewed as the party of socialism when there are people who fall through the cracks and they need a hand up and that's what the government is doing versus turning a blind eye 
yeah. from what the Trump Republicans are talking about, turn the blind eye on those who are hurting and support the rich um, yeah. who pay $750 in taxes <laughs> and taxes. they get $250,000 worth of treatment for COVID when your friend and supporter Herman Cain died and then you have a super spreader event the other day and your HUD secretary gets COVID today and then another preacher um, dies today. You know who I'm talking about? <laughs> Harry Jackson Jr. died today. When? You didn't today? know that? Today. No. Harry Jackson died. Harry Jackson Jr. died this morning from that super spreader event at the White House. Jesus, I did not know that. It's I out knew, it's I, on my Twitter. Go look on my Twitter on the Twitter. I, I knew I knew that Meadows had gotten it, and 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 Carson, who should be ashamed of himself as a surgeon and a doctor, you know, promoting. I couldn't even believe when Carson was against the Affordable Care Act and protecting people with pre-existing conditions. Now, here's the thing: Carson operated on my daughter. When she was a baby, I, I don't know you what took her to Hopkins. Him. You took her to Hopkins? Yeah, I took her to Hopkins because she had a brain disorder. And she's well, but she asked me the question. She said, Daddy, why does the doctor that operated on me want me dead? They say, look, said, I, 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 let me tell you, here? and you know I'm in Baltimore. And uh -huh. you know I'm in Baltimore, and, and Dr. Carson was an icon here. Sure. Um, and he did a lot of good in the community before he got all up in the trunk. Um, but what, I don't, what, I, what I'm told from those who used to deal with him, he's different from yesterday than what he is today. I spent a lot of time with him when my daughter was in surgery, and I visited. I never heard or picked up any of this stuff. But you know, you said something a minute ago. You know, Harris dead. Okay, Meadows has it. Uh, Carson's and, got and, it. And, and, Herman Cain died. Her, and Herman Cain died. Now here, you know, when you when when, when you have this level of death. And we may have as high as, you know, for, we could get to 400,000 people um, before January 21st. It could be very high. You know, this kind of necropolitics where you just decide you're going to follow somebody who does not care. And then you think about, but the senators and McConnell, you know, one of the things we got to say to folks is, wait a minute, these folks have public health care because you pay for it. <laughs> I mean, basically, they he all got, have public look, healthcare. Trump's got public housing that he doesn't want to give up. He's That's got public right. housing, public health care, and he ain't even paid into it. Seven hundred fifty fifty dollars no. for right. for our for taxes. He's That's supposedly right. prepaid. Let me see the prepaid receipts. Show yeah. me the receipts, Mr. President. And all of them have they they never have voted to lessen their wages. None of the con. That the, you don't have to serve six years in the Senate to get a full pension for the rest of your life. The immorality of people who would have those things, and the only reason they have it is because people elected them and then they don't want the people that elected them, even their own constituency, to have the same thing that they have. This, this crowd is, 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 it's a septic kind of sickness, you know. And, and the ones time, that yeah. call it socialism, April, that, they don't even know what socialism is. They don't, but you they know what? socialism to communism. They don't know it either one of me. I mean, if you ask them <laughs> to define it, because, because first of all, what's so silly about it is we, we, um, we, we went to Congress and we presented the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for moral revival budget in 2019. We went before the budget committee. We had poor and low wealth people of every race, creed, and color with us. We had a budget. One of the Republican congresspersons six, uh, asked to speak, he said, I'm bothered that you came in here with these stoles on saying Jesus was a poor man. Now, I've been a Christian all my life, and I can't read anywhere in the Bible where Jesus challenged Caesar. So I raised my hand and said, are you comparing yourself to Caesar? I said, you, we have a bigger problem than I thought. This man literally thought that he, he says, I've been a Christian all my life, but I've been taught that Jesus never had anything to do with Caesar. And I said, and that is the problem. You've got a bunch of folk that have been raised on a false kind of religion, where, where and it comes all the way back from slaveholder religion, where they believe you somehow have faith, you can pray for people on Sunday, but on Monday you can do any dirty, nasty thing you want to do politically. And I'm going to call a right. name out. I'm going to call one of them names out. Mike Huckabee. Mm -hmm. the oh, daddy Lord, yes. Sarah oh, yeah. Sanders. That man, ooh, he went after me on Good Friday and <laughs> lied on me. I said, you're going straight to hell. And yeah. <laughs> 
said, you and your daughter are a bunch of crooked head liars. I said, I can't deal with this. So go back to the issue. And before we go back to the issue, explain the issue about Caesar and Jesus so people can understand. You, you brought up the, the, the situation. I want you to explain. But before we go there, people are asking what happened to Ben Carson. Ben Carson has now has been diagnosed with COVID. There was a super spreader event at the White House recently. Uh, Mark Meadows has been the president's chief of staff. Diagnosed with COVID. This is like the third wave of COVID at the White House. At the White House. At the yeah. at the People's House. That's why I will not go back. A reporter, no. we just got word last night, a reporter was diagnosed with COVID at the White House. Um, and now uh, Reverend Harry Jackson Jr., who was at that super spreader event, is now dead. He died this morning. Um, he died this morning. He was He was diagnosed with it last week and died this morning. They were trying to keep it secret. You can't keep that stuff secret. And he is a supporter. He was a supporter of Trump. I know for a fact. I know. I knew the pastor. That's right. Well, you know, and the sad thing, and I'm going to just speak frank because Jesus used some word. If you don't give a damn about your own house, you're sure not going to try to protect mine. Now, think about that. You made the White House a super spreader. You know then they don't care about what happens. He doesn't care house. about anybody but himself. That's right. And he those around him. We have to always add the enablers. I understand Mitch McConnell went to the floor of the Senate today and basically said some of the same mess that Trump has been saying about the election. This, this, these enablers, you know, this, I think that most of them aren't really mad that Trump's what belief they mad because he talks so openly about it. Because remember, from in 1968, Pat Buchanan and Philip Stone Nixon, we can never avow this publicly. We must always disavow what we're doing publicly. Mm -hmm. And and that's been the standard. That's been the standard. So yeah. Carson, so it looks like Carson and and uh, Mark Meadows and 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 Bishop Harry Jackson Jr. attended a White House event. The White House event was a gathering on election night, where dozens of guests dozens of guests mingled, few wearing masks. Yeah, we saw it. On, that's right, we saw it. Election night. Mm -hmm. um, the night that the president did not want to believe that he was going to lose. Yeah. He still doesn't want to believe he's going to lose. He's lost. They're trying lost. to, they're wasting money, the RNC's money to file these lawsuits, these frivolous lawsuits, talking about voter suppression and voter fraud. We've been suppressed. Where's the attorney general talking? Pastor, That's right. Bishop, That's right. where's the attorney general talking about how he dismantled the post office sorting machines so black folks couldn't send their mail-in ballot in or the Democrats couldn't send their mail-in ballots. They hijacked the mailbox. That's, That's right. voter suppression. From our state. The guy, and the guy that used it did it from our state of North Carolina. And he had messed up a government office before they hired him. And look, never forget, the first thing Jeff Sessions did when he became attorney general before Bob, was pulled out of the case in North Carolina that ended up proving that the Republicans had engaged in racism with surgical precision. He pulled the, uh, he pulled the United States out of that case, basically to send a signal that the attorney general's office was no longer on the side of those facing real voter suppression, racist voter suppression, but would be on the side of the suppressors. Don't talk to me about fraud, please, dear God. What no, you have no. done, you have allowed Russia to come in here create bots to go after us and target us and, and confuse us. You've dis disheveled our sorting machines. You put people out there to intimidate people with guns and stuff. I am so done. It is time for him to go. Eric Holder uh, Bishop said, um, he said, you know, Trump has said he's not going all he wants. What's going to happen is Joe Biden's going to take the oath of office on January 20th, 2021 at noon. At noon. At noon. Once it's over, they will give all the codes to not Trump, but to Joe Biden. Once again, after Joe Biden takes the oath of office on January 20, 2021 at noon, he mm -hmm. gives all the codes to include the nuclear codes. If Donald Trump doesn't come to the inauguration, if he's held up in the White House, all they're going to do is just go in and get him. Yeah, he got him to out, go. He got to go. Out. He has to go. He got to go. Let me take my <laughs> shoes. Uh, you know what? You know what Medea said. He right? got to go. <laughs> Medea said, "I don't know where you're going, but you got to get up out of here. You got to get out of here." <laughs> I'm gonna tell you something. I'm gonna tell you something. He's got to. And the sad thing about it is, I was there when Al Gore and George W. Bush didn't know who was gonna be who. Yeah. 
but they were dignified about it. And That's said, let's right. just see what happened. Not holding, I mean, we're in a pandemic and this crazy man wants to have super spreader events to rally the base, the base of the base to fight us. That's what he wants to do. He mm -hmm. wants to fight. He That's wants right. to create, so, so, so give us a word, help us understand because there is a brighter day of the core oh, sure. and unification. Give us a word right now because we, because we, we are in the wilderness with this one. We, we, we yeah. see, we see the promised land in the midst of wearing our masks and our, our, our we call them things, our shields. Mm -hmm. But, mm -hmm. you know, but help us, help us understand what is going on. Well, you know, April, you gotta, when you understand, some things I get out of the Bible, some things I get from looking at insights and movies. Remember in the Rise of the Dark Knight, the guy asked what was the Joker's problem, and it said some people just like to watch the world burn. Ooh. Right, and that's basically what Trump is. He he get any way he can get attention, people following him, putting themselves at risk feeds his narcissism, and it feeds his enablers narcissism. So I we believe have to he's move mentally on. unstable. Yeah. I do. I do that's believe right. he's mentally unstable. And many of the folk around, I, you know, I, I, and I know some of them have spent so much time. You know, they've been so divided and so distorted. You know, racism. When you mix racism and economic problem. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a witch's brew of deception. But we have to move on. I've said, this is what I believe is the path to healing, April. I really, really believe this. Is President-elect Biden and Vice President-elect Kamala Harris, Kamala, and, the, and Nancy Pelosi, and hopefully we'll get two senators out of Georgia. But Reverend Warnock is one of them. That's right, Reverend one up, my good friend, and, and but Osop is another one. One of the things ha has to happen now is, you know how they say um, we have to heal the soul of the nation? Mm -hmm. Well, I want to I wanna translate that a little bit. Now, I'm a Christian. God healed the soul of, of the people by coming in flesh and by touching the people. You know, oftentimes, the disciples would say, well, let's pray for somebody. Jesus would say, uh-uh, let's heal them. Let's feed them. The best thing they can do is put out a vision to address the people's pain. But I, I said to the vice president, he put it in the ad when he, when he was vice president, before he was president, that the hope is in the morning, M-O-U-R-N-I-N-G. And I said, if you address in your policies the hurt people are going through, and the mourning they're going through. And if people see the kind of policies that are going, that's going to give them sick leave and give them unemployment and give them health care and p give them a living wage and address the systemic racism, both in police brutality, but also in the other areas and voting rights and so forth, people who may even be over there will move. They will get healed because they're sick, they're afraid, they're scared. Even 62% of Republicans want a living wage. So when somebody's been drinking dirty water, mm. you, you have to offer them clean water. And if they ever get a taste of it, that's why I think it's so dangerous for people to start saying to Biden and Harris now, well, you know, we got to be moderate. We got to be centrist. You can't do it. No, they ran saying they wanted 15 and a union. April, if you put 15 in the union into policy, that's 49 million people rising up out of poverty immediately and 54% of all African-Americans. They ran on expanding health care and protecting people with um, pre-existing conditions. That has to be, not in the first 100 days, in the first 50 days. They ran on addressing voting rights. That has to happen. People now have to see what they ran on. And they have to see them dealing with COVID. And that's what's going to heal the nation. There's no way to heal like some kind of spiritual healing that does not connect to fixing the body of the nation. The body is sick. People mm -hmm. are scared. People are dying. And they have to see that. And when they see that, they will turn away from, from a lot of them will turn away from this desperate and this uh, uh, that we have now. But even if they don't, we have to move on. The yeah, country has to move forward. Yeah. There comes a time you have to shake the dust off your feet and move on. And the one thing you cannot do now, he cannot allow McConnell to dictate what he does. We've had enough of McConnell and, 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 and uh, um, Trump. 
people are looking for a president, vice president, and a speaker who will fight for their lives, who will fight for their lives. All these essential workers, all these people that are dying because they're working, poor people that are dying three times more likely. Real quickly, let me share this with you. We, we contacted 2.3 million poor and low-wealth people that were infrequent voters from September to, to, to um, November to get them to vote. Over 20%, which is a high number, voted early because we contacted. We contacted them about an agenda, though. And, and, and it already has come out. It was an article in PBS that said poor and low-wealth people made the difference in Michigan and several others. But they were voting for their lives. And that's what has to happen. And we have to back. President Biden and, 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 and uh, Vice President-elect uh, Harris. We can't walk away from them now. And if they put bills on the desk of McConnell, you know, he's already said he's the grim reaper. That's what he said. Then we may, if we risk our lives to vote, we may have to go inside that Senate. We may have to engage in massive nonviolent civil disobedience, but we cannot let Biden control the, I mean, McConnell dictate the vision and the hope and the help that, that Biden and Harris want to give the people. So let's let's and, and let's let's make this clear. And this is this is not just a godly lesson. This is a civics lesson because I believe some of this unrest is because people do not have the knowledge to understand how government works, how reporters are the fourth estate. When checks and balances don't work, we ask questions for accountability. People don't understand it. So this is part of civics uh, class. Um, and this, I'm not even going to get into schoolhouse rock. Uh, That's right. Bill, you know, um, yes, I'm a bill, only a bill sitting here on Capitol Hill. Go look it up. So anyway, um, <laughs> <laughs> Mitch McConnell and this Trumpyism mentality, even though President Trump is leaving, it doesn't mean the mentality has not left. No. Him. Mm -mm. And that's what you're fighting now. Mitch McConnell, even before Trump was there, even before Trump was even a thought, they didn't even like Trump, okay? When That's he right. Was running. But when, when, when Barack Obama was there, he said that he was going to work to get him out, make him a one-termer. Remember that? That's and it right. didn't happen. So let's, 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 let's be truthful. This is the truth and nothing but the truth. Now, uh, Joe Biden is, is now going in, trying to unify. The first today, Understanding we're seeing the highest numbers of COVID cases now in the nation. Mm -hmm. He said he's working on a blueprint with people, doctors, and scientists. So on January 20th, when he becomes president, he hits the ground running to try to prevent, um, medicate, and treat this issue and mandate with masks. For those who don't like masks, I know we're getting acne, but it's going to save your life. You can go to a dermatologist at any time and fix the acne. Yeah, pull a look on it. Would you say, sir? Put a little lotion on it and a little Vaseline. Put a little lotion. Put a little lotion. <laughs> <laughs> Put a little lotion. You know, what's that? What's that? Um, what's that little thing in the tube that they out of the tube? I don't know. People put a whole bunch. Put a little lotion on it. So okay. now, with that said, Joe Biden is trying to now look at what his cabinet looks like. We understand, Bishop, that um that they are looking at making their administration to reflect their base. Who is their base? Us. Right. We That's put right. Joe Biden over the top. You've got people that they're talking about. My girl, Simone Sanders. Okay, she can chart her course anywhere. Um, Marsha Fudge, Congresswoman out of Ohio. That's right. Out of Ohio. Cedric Richmond, Congressman out of NOLA. NOLA. He's a bad right. brother. He's a bad sisters and brothers. Then you got the baddest sister who wears a cape, Keisha Lance Bottoms. Okay? That's right. Mayor of Atlanta. Then you also have another bad sister. Her name happens to be Susan Rice. Mm -hmm. Susan Rice is poised to possibly be the next Secretary of State or the next head of the Department of Defense. She can be all of that, a sister. That's right. You know That's what's right. you know what's going to be the problem? If that Senate does not flip blue, because That's they are right. not going to let her. They don't want her in there. She's That's qualified. Right. And they talk about Benghazi. Guess what? It was terrible that those people died. And she used the information that, that, that they had. And all of I was there. All of them were using the same information. But she was the one they pointed out. Why? Because she's a black woman. That's now, right. now, check this out. They're going to talk about Benghazi, but how many people has this president allowed to die? Benghazi, well, you could count that on two hands. People died in Benghazi. And, 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 and it's not, it's sad, nonetheless. Mm -hmm. It's sad and never should have happened. 
and how many people have died during COVID. That's right. And how many are going to die. That's why in two weeks on the 23rd, the Poor People's Campaign, we're having a mass every state caravan of remembrance and call to action, remembering all the people that have died. We have to have some public rituals. We can't let that just pass over. You know, a quarter million people died and you just passed. We've, all, we've already done that, April, every year with poverty. You know, 700 people died a day from poverty, according to Columbia University study before COVID. But you can't allow this. Martin called one time. Martin said poverty was a, Martin King, was a form of policy murder. People have literally been killed, policy destroyed, and died, did not have to die. Now, in saying that, I also want to say, and you mentioned, that's why two things. Georgia is, 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 I can't even say how important it is. Everybody turned it out. I'm Uh-oh, did we just lose them? Okay, there you go. I'm there sorry, we got to we gotta connect that to the, those, even if it's 25%, 27 there's enough progressive white folk in Georgia hooked with a massive turnout of black people to turn this thing and turn the Senate. We need the Senate. Now, if we get it, it's one thing. If you don't get it, I'm telling you, though, you remember, it, 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 19, you said when you were born, 1965 was not an election year. Nobody that got elected in 64 had planned to vote for a Voting Rights Act, but the people changed the political atmosphere. We cannot let McConnell, if he was to be the, the new, uh, I, I don't think he will, I think we're going to win in Georgia, but if he is still the Senate leader, we're going to have to be quite creative and serious, not just talking. and We may have to do some very, very serious nonviolent things to put pressure because we can't let him dictate to Biden and Harris. We have to fight for this democracy. We can't just vote for this democracy. We've got to fight for it. And that's why he's reaching out to Republicans. He's doing his team of rivals. Um, Barack Obama did it. It's all based off of Abraham Lincoln. He's getting people from the opposing party to try to soften the blow. There is such angst. Um, between parties right now. There's also infighting within parties, which is ridiculous. But ridiculous. what I, it's ridiculous. But what I will say, there's more on the there's more on um on the plate that could be thwarted by um by the Senate not flipping. Joe Biden also made a promise to nominate a black woman as the next the Supreme Justice. Court. That's right. That's right. We That's have right. lost when when, when when Clarence, uh, not Clarence, excuse me, when Thurgood Marshall died, we never got another Thurgood Marshall. What did we get? Mm -mm. That's right. Never got. We got, that's right. Mr. Justice Ginsburg passed away. That's right. So I, there's some names being floated out there to include my line sister, my soul of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated. You see right back there? Oh, Lord, I see it. I see it. <laughs> yes. She um got kicked the pinkies in and make my men. So she, my line sister, Sherlyn Eiffel, is poised to be, um, she's, well, her name is, is one of the names that you hear for being the U.S. Supreme Court nominee if there is an opportunity. So she's a black woman and, who's fighting. And she hits Ruth Bader Ginsburg and Thurgood Marshall. Okay. And April, let me tell you something. There are some senators that are up in 2022 that if we have to put pressure on them. Now, what Democrats are going to have to learn is you got to put pressure with faces and people. It's not just talking to policy, you see. you got to make folk from that state who are sick, who are being affected by COVID. And I'm talking about of all races, creeds, and color. And we're, we're doing a dive right now. We're looking at the Senate in our campaign, and we're looking at who comes up in 22 and who's vulnerable and who, if they... For instance, if there's a senator representing people from Appalachia, then you got to put some Appalachian folk in their office. You got to put some a Appalachian folk there to push them. What I'm saying is the same thing you're saying. We, we must fight for Georgia's two. Georgia's two must become Democrat. That's a fight. And we must plan for if that doesn't happen, that we are not going to just say, well, there's nothing we can do and sit back. Because people stood in line to vote, literally risked their lives to vote. And we must do whatever we have to do in the coming days. Because let me tell you something. When I think about the fact, um, 
um, April. And I've been all over this country with my co-chair, Reverend Liz. They all have. We've been, we've walked in the waters of the Rio Grande to meet and, uh, undocumented people. We've been in Appalachia. We've been in deep Delta, Mississippi. We've been working, we've got white farmers hooking up with, with black fast food workers in the campaign. But from March to September, 8 million more people fell into poverty. 8 million. I did. I, I just did a simple division on that April. You know that's fifty three thousand three hundred and thirty three point three three people per day. While billionaires in that same time made eight over eight hundred billion dollars. Eight hundred in, in in this this year. That's the kind of gross inequity. And I know and I believe that there is a remnant of folk out here. I'm meeting them everywhere. And, and, I, and when we talk about the Poor People's Campaign, you know, I talked to you earlier about it. We say, even to white folk who are poor and low wealth, the first thing you got to deal with, you're going to deal with poverty, is systemic racism. Systemic racism, poverty, ecological devastation, the war. We, I, when I'm in Appalachia, I talk about race just like I'm talking to you now. I don't have a different message in Africa. No, you don't. And, no, and you don't. You are true to who right. you are everywhere right. you go. Right. Because you gotta, you got to get at least a remnant of folk to understand that the same people that will block your living wages is the same folk that will block my voting rights and kill my baby, simply, my children, my son, simply because they're black. And that that they because because when you're sick with racism, you'll do just about anything to anybody to get your way. And so we have to challenge both systemic racism and systemic poverty simultaneously. Simultaneously. Yeah, I talked to it, it, well, two things. Um, I talked to Congresswoman Maxine Waters over the weekend, and mm -hmm. I actually I was reaching out to all the women who Donald Trump had 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 ditched. Yeah, yeah. I talked That's to nice Mel Hill. I talked to Yamish, and I talked to Maxine Waters. I said, I asked everybody, "How you feel?" And they were right. like, "It's almost over, but it's not going to be over." And I'm, I'm with because it was. I'm gonna tell you, and I'm being honest. I ran out my house, got my white neighbor. We ran out in the street, started screaming, and I was like, "He's going to prison! He's going to prison!" I was jumping and shouting in this house like I was in church. I was like, Lord, you have not forgotten me or forsaken me. And not just me, but everybody. This is some this is George Wallace. This That's is right. this That's people right. don't understand. Bull Connor, George Wallace, they're not putting hoses on us yet, but they're tear gassing and taking mm -hmm. us all That's in the right. name of decency and order. Decency and freedom Peaceful and protection. people. And protecting the suburbs, but you, but you know, biblically, and you know that's that old racist stereotype: the white right. women versus black men, because they say Cory Booker is going to be head of HUD. That's the right. Black man offending the the white women. Come on, that's now. Right. That's all that is. But you know, since a lot of your folk are also people of faith on your Instagram, you know who Trump reminds me most of in the Bible? Never can oh, Never can Come on now, come with it. Come with the word. Mm -hmm. And let me tell you why. Because in the Bible, it says about Nebuchadnezzar that they warned, he got a warning. And the warning was, if you treat the poor right and treat those that are on the margins, this is actually in the word, God will protect you. Mm. Instead, Nebuchadnezzar walked out onto his balcony. Listen to this. Walked out onto the balcony of his house, looked out over it and said, Look at how great I have made Babylon. I have made not. Yeah, right, right. He said, look at how great I have made Babylon. And then the Bible says that the spirit of the Lord said, and that day his kingdom was snatched from him. All and things then, come from thee, O Lord. Right, O Lord. And then, of course, he ended up getting sick, too. Nebuchadnezzar did. And you and know so, what? Somebody, right. And someone said, we got so many questions people talk you know, and, and you are absolutely right. There's so many different things. I had Bishop Jakes on last week or the other week. We were up here crying. We were crying on the, it was like, it was crazy. But he said, you know, some people are coming to him saying, this is the exodus. I said, yeah. He said, it's the end of times. I said, but you know what? This could be the marking, the demarcation line for the end of times. But the de end of times could be 20 years from now or yeah. could be thousands of years from now. This could be the demarcation of the beginning of the end of times. But then I talked to Bishop Paul S. Morton, you know, P.J. Morton's daddy, the Grammy right. Award winner. <laughs> he said it 
reminds him of the Exodus. I said, oh, Pharaoh, let my people go. That's you know, right. there was famine in the land. There was Passover. There was pestilence. There was, there was locusts. We had locusts. We got killer bees. What do you say? Well, I say that all of those references in the Bible let us know. Every reference in the Bible about pestilence is connected to bad leadership. Every one of them. And what the scriptures are basically saying is that the universe is even against injustice. That God does not, cannot allow anybody to stand up and say, I have made things great and I'm bigger and better. Which but you read, you so your word, your word, that's right. it out. That's, your that's, word, that's, that's right. But here's what I would say to all clergy this must be three things in this moment. And I'm very serious about this. This time must be a time of repentance for the way many clergy have walked away from the public square. We've not done what our foreparents did and Martin and other clergy. Some of us have gotten too, too, too comfortable. And we find the Teslas and wearing red bottoms. Right, <laughs> right. That's right. And some of them have to admit they help support some of this stuff when they supported Reagan and Bush and 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 there was some that supported Trump. And let's you know, you can't just you can't just be against Trump and not be against Trumpism, right? This also has to be a time of re-engagement, re-engagement, where we re-engage the power, the prophetic power, the moral authority. You know, Jesus' first sermon started with the poor. Mm -hmm. You can go to church all year long and never hear a sermon there on the poor. Now, I mean, Jesus' first sermon and his last sermon started with the poor, his whole life. And he said a nation is going to be judged by that. We, we, we have to, inside the church, in the religious arena, we've got some repenting to do and some re-engagement to do. And then the third thing, I believe this is a moment of reconstruction. You know, you had the first reconstruction, 1868, 1896, second one, 1854, I mean, 1954, 1968. I think we've got an opportunity. You think about what just happened. A white man and a black woman ran for president and vice president in a time of COVID, in a time of great division. They win by the largest margin ever in the history of the country. And they win running openly, openly talking about $15 a union, expanding health care, and addressing systemic racism. You Charlottesville was the impetus. That's right. Can I say it again? Charlottesville it. was the impetus. Charlottesville, right. It was the impetus. You haven't had a, think about it now, let's be real. You haven't had a Democratic candidate for president talking openly about systemic racism and raising the minimum wage and spend, you, have, you, didn't, you haven't had it. You, that's new. And the impetus being Charlottesville and in the minute where we had Breonna Taylor and George Floyd to, to both be Ahmaud Aubrey. Ahmaud Aubrey. Oh. All of these deaths. All these deaths. And this multicultural racial ra multi racist ra multicultural multi racial movements that the, the from the environment to Black Lives Matter to Sunrise to Poor People's Campaign to the Women's March. This is a moment, right? Yes. This is a moment in time. And the fact that they are winning in Georgia and in the West and in the Midwest and in the Northeast and almost won in several other Southern states. We are seeing the destruction of the Southern strategy. We are seeing the last throws of the Southern strategy, April. And if we understand that, I often say, I said the other day, if you can run on 15 the union and medic and expanding healthcare and systemic racism, what if they had run on even more than that? I mean, this country is ready. The majority of the people are not with this foolishness. And this foolishness, right? And let's what talk we about have, the what we who have done. Vote. We got we seventy. Have, we got seventy some million plus who voted for Trump, but there's still a lot of millions more who didn't vote. Still. Eighty million folk didn't even vote because a hundred million didn't vote last time, and about twenty some million more voted this time. And and think about it, April. In the South, from Maryland over to Nevada, if you count those states, that's about one hundred ninety three, hundred ninety six electoral college votes. Once you start breaking into those states, Nevada, Arizona, Texas is going to fall. South Carolina almost fell. Florida is going to fall eventually. North Carolina's coming. Georgia's a sign of all of that. Uh, uh, Espy was within two points in Mississippi. Come on. A black man in Mississippi. We are seeing right now 
the possibility of building these fusion coalitions, black and white and brown, that can break the South. And if you ever break the South, Republican extremism is over. It, it might be around, but it won't hold power. And, and listen to this. In the Southeast, you have more black people. More, the black population is concentrate, concentrated in the Southeast. That's so right. You have more black people in the Southeast of this nation than anywhere. Yeah, I know you think you got a lot of blacks up in Baltimore and up in New York and up in Philly. Down Southeast is where the black population okay. is concentrated. Um, now, I want to hit something once again. Once again, you getting all these phone calls. I see, but I'm so glad you're with me. We got a few moments. I can't believe the time is almost up just being with you. It's like we just started talking two minutes ago. So, but I'm going to tell you something. If you ever want a phone call with, with, with Reverend Barbara, you'd be like, okay. <laughs> he, would, he gives you all the history, the information. He's amazing. And that's why I love being on, being on with him. I got to tell you one day, I'm going to tell you online how I stole the Delta line, though, when I was in college. I can't say it online. Look at your eye. <laughs> all right now all right now. Uh, <laughs> come on so roars now we let's not be mad at reverend bob right now <laughs> 06 06 06 all the megas all the megas got mad but they couldn't handle it i'm sorry i'm sorry <laughs> okay that's for another conversation that's so right. listen <laughs> so listen Reverend Barber, so he is the co-chair of the Poor People's Campaign. And it is so significant. Dr. King, Martin Luther King Jr., if we say King or whatever, this is Reverend Dr. King, the Reverend okay. Martin Luther King, this is who we're talking about. If Bobby Kennedy and Dr. King were alive today, do you know that the movement of civil rights would have gone into another phase of poverty? Those yeah. two were working, were planning on working on poverty, and they were killed six weeks apart. Yeah. The dream, the dreamer is gone, but the dream is still there. And, and Reverend Barber has picked it up. We are still, that was 67. We're in 2020. We're still dealing with issues of poverty. Paul Ryan was trying to deal with issues of poverty. We're still dealing with this. And this president doesn't even have the word poverty on his tongue. No. In and too often. To be... In his heart, in his mind, anywhere. And, and the problem is, and I, you know, I've had a challenge with Republicans try to racialize poverty if they talk about it. Democrats are too often. They talk about it, but it's in code word. They say people trying to make it into the American dream. Dr. King would say to us, say the word, say the condition. We got 15 million more people in poverty than when Dr. King was alive. You know, I was just talking to Joe Kennedy today, one of the grandsons of poverty, and, and, and uh, we, we're having a serious conversation. We cannot survive April as a, as a republic yeah. when before COVID there were 140 million people either poor or low wealth. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Poor or left one emergency from from disaster, and on top of that, eighty seven million people before COVID without health care. And listen to this one: sixty two million people that work every day for less than a living wage, seven hundred people dying a day from poverty. And it doesn't have to be that we we come, we're coming out with a study. In fact, it's out now, but with EPI and the Poor People's Campaign Economic Policy Institute, and it shows that a moral budget is an economically sound budget. That 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 if you that 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 if you do right by poor and low wealth people, it actually benefits the whole society. Yes, it, it does. It is not socialism. It is Christianity, if you will. It not only is that, let's take it out of religion. It's the Constitution. Because when people say we want domestic tranquility, healing, we want people to come together. Well, what does the Constitution say? You cannot get to domestic tranquility without doing establishment of justice, providing for the common defense, and promoting the general welfare. You don't, you, you don't, it, domestic tranquility is not the first hope of our society. <clears throat> Establishing justice, pro providing for the common defense, promoting the general welfare is the only way. Now, in the street, we say no justice, no peace, but it's the same language. It's just different. So, you, so poverty, you can't have almost 50% of your people in the wealthiest nation in the country existing in poverty, and they don't have to be. So, okay, so, 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 so Reverend Bob just went schoolhouse right for all you old heads. I know the demographic that we have. Come on. We the people in order to form a more perfect, perfect union. union. That's establish right. Establish justice in the Say it, Reverend Bob. <laughs> it's establish justice, provide for the common Reverend defense, promote, promote the general, the general welfare, welfare and, and establish, that right, ensure domestic tranquility, tranquility provide right. for the common defense, promote right. the general welfare. I, I get the words with stuff, but if I'm saying it, I can say it, but singing it's like, oh my God. That's, if you don't know, go to Schoolhouse Rock. Come on, right. rock it on Schoolhouse Rock. And, and here's the thing, April. I'm going to say it on your show. I know we got a minute left, I think. 
when we talk about a black agenda, let's get real. Let's get very real. And I say this to preachers all the time. I said, how can you not be dealing with the issue of poverty and pushing policies to lift the poor when 60.9% of black people are poor and or low wealth? And a lot of these black people in these churches are nothing right. but poor, need right. help. Right. You say that poor and low. And if you, and that's why I, that's why when people tell me, well, you have, when Biden said he was going, he was going to openly be for $15 a union. I, there are other things we want, but I know that 49 million people immediately come out of poverty. If you start paying 15 on the union and $368 billion goes into the economy. Someone said that they were focused on black business. I said, yes, yes, yes. We got to have black business. But if black folk don't have any money, they can't spend them at black business. And so poverty and low wealth has to be a centerpiece issue of anybody claiming to be concerned first about black people and secondly about America. You cannot have 50% of your people in poverty and low wealth. And what Dr. King said is there were three areas, poverty, racism, militarism, all three connected. We say systemic poverty, systemic racism, ecological devastation, denial of health care, the war economy, $800 billion a year in a war economy. We, if we cut that in half, you know, in April, we would still have more money in the war economy than Russia, uh, China, Iran, Iraq, and North Korea. And then this white false narrative of white nationalism. Those five interlocking injustices must be challenged. We must challenge them in policy. And at www.poorpeoplescampaign.org, you can go to it and see the Poor People's uh, Moral Jubilee Justice Budget put together by some of the best economists and thinkers and people on the ground in this country. And people want to know, people want to know where they can donate to your organization. Um, and we're talking, as we're talking donations, right. where do they go to donate for you? If they want to, the, the organ sponsor organization for the Poor People's Campaign is Repairs of the Breach. Just go to www.breachrepairs.org. If they want to just do something with the Poor People's Campaign, just go directly to www.poorpeoplescampaign.org. But if you do it, Repairs is going to be used for the Poor People's Campaign anyway. And we just welcome, you know, people helping. And, but more importantly, they can hook up they can sign up. They can get on our mail list. They can join one of our 43 state coordinators. When you started talking to me, April, folks told me we were crazy. They said, you crazy, crazy. You can't go up there in the Apple Lab. You can't do this. Well, since I talked to you in 2017, we now have 43 state coordinating committees. Each state is connected to 10,000 to 20,000 plus people in that state, which is over a million and some people. And in this election, we touch 2.3 million lower poor and low wealth voters across this country, and we're still building. And on June 20th of this past year, we had a mass poor people's assembly, Marl March on Washington. You helped promote it. It was digital. We had 3 million people to show up online. We can't wait till COVID is over because we're going to put the biggest mass poor people's assembly you've seen in the street in D.C. of all people, race, color, creed, sexuality, pushing a new agenda for a new day to address poverty in this country. So also, um, and, and, and guys, uh, I just pinned uh, breachrepairs.org, and um, there was another one. Um, I tried to pin that one, but I think you can only do it one at a time. But we want to support you because you're doing the work, not for you, but for us, for we the people. And we forget, we've been bullied into submission so much that we forget we're part of that equation, we the people. We the uh, people. Who we are still people. forming a more perfect union in the midst of growing pains. And I would be remiss, um, I saved the best for last. But I'm going back to Georgia. Um, yep. <clears throat> uh, uh, Star Jones is 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 galvanizing. Maxine Waters is galvanizing. Everybody's galvanizing for money to support these campaigns. It takes money to support campaigns. Now, I don't donate. I don't even endorse. But I'm telling you what's going on. Money is needed for advertisement to keep the campaigns going. People are pouring money into these campaigns. Um, because, once again, you could actually change the dynamic of the Senate. Um, if these two in Georgia and change history, and make change history. history. That's right. That's right. That's this right. is serious business. What? What? If you get changed at those two seats, it could change <laughs> the course of history for the next twenty years. And and oh, here's boy. hello Melba Moore. Hello, the great Melba Moore joins us. Hey Mel. Hey, I drove Melba, and when I was in college, I drove Melba to the homecoming dance and the homecoming concert. 
in a in a in a maroon Lincoln. I picked her up at the hotel. I was student government president at the time. You hey, were Melba. How you doing? <laughs> but no, I am so pleased that Melba Moore joins. She she honors me by joining in. And I just feel so we've had so many people. We had Common Queen Lizzie. We had so many people who joined in Maxwell. Um, so many different people who joined in. And all of you make me feel good by joining in. But Melba Moore, thank you so much. You just you just you just Touch my heart. I remember you back in the day when I was a kid in Pearl. Let's not even talk about that. My parents took me to see you at Mars Mechanic Theater in Baltimore. So now let's talk about this. These two seats is crucial. I want you guys to understand that Barack Obama won the presidency by your donations. Everyone thinks, oh, if I donate, do a bunch of commas and zeros. Mm -mm. He mm -hmm. won by $25, the average of $25 from us. You can do what you can do, and that little bit can help. Each penny, each dime, each quarter, each dollar makes a difference. If you want to put 10, 20, 100, you can do that. But I'm saying you don't have to think it's got to be thousands of dollars to donate, right? Right, Pastor? That's right. You, you, a little bit, because you're thinking about it, if a million people get $25, that's $25 million. And that's, and that's if 500,000 give $25, then, then um, uh, 500000 give 25 what is that, $12 million. And so the re reality is a little goes much because it's connected to a whole lot. Mm -hmm. And if you can't do the money, listen, we, we, we've told, I told Stacy, we've got about 3,000 people in the Poor People's Campaign. We don't endorse, I endorse personally, but we don't endorse as a campaign. But we've got about 3,000 nonpartisan folk. We're ready to put down there to call people, to, mark, to walk and to knock on doors. Everybody can do something. Everybody can do something. And just like Selma changed uh -huh. the world, what happens in Georgia is the biggest political moment in our lifetimes. I'm serious, you all. It's serious. This, this is serious business. And we have to you go. You hear this? You hear this? Yeah. You hear this? Who is I that? Ray Charles in Georgia. Ray Charles. So That's before right. we go, say something about the Shiro superhero, Stacey Abrams. And this, we're gonna go to Ray Charles. Stacey Abrams is an organizer of parks a lot. She is a political uh, genius. She is committed, but she commits to the work. Her and I have been knowing each other for a while. You know, we were doing Marl Monday in North Carolina. And we talk about how our goal is to change the South. But that sister is, 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 is the one she got cheated out of an election. But, but, she, didn't, she, but she didn't roll away and go away. She even be, began to build more power. And she has said something to Democrats, and I want to join her and say it. Invest in the South. Invest in the South invest in black candidates in the South and don't wait till the next election. Do it now because you can see what, what can happen. If the resources are there and the organizing is there, you, and somebody like Stacey Abrams can show you what is possible. And if you think this is the end, no, this is the beginning, baby. What you're seeing now in Georgia, this is just the beginning of a new South and a new day and a new rising. You know, there's a song that said, it ain't the waking, it's the rising. It's a tribute to Nina Simone by Hozier. It's not the waking, it's the rising. So we woke, but we also going to get up out of bed. We're going to fight. We're going to turn the South around because this, this, what we saw these last four years can never, never, never happen again in this nation. Pastor William Barber, and I got Ray Charles playing with Georgia on my mind. I think that uh, is, if we can't do a gospel song, we're doing the gospel of an uprising of a people right. who have been suppressed, depressed, and oppressed, and right. understanding that miracles do happen. The supernatural can come in the midst. That's right. If we work, if you work, faith without works is dead, but faith with works is powerful and can change the world. Faith. And listen, this is my favorite scripture, and I'll, I'll quit on this. Back in the day when they were hurting and people would blow up their homes, inevitably somebody would look at it and say, yeah, they did that, but the just shall live by faith. And then they would say, but we are not of those, Hebrews 10, 39, we are not of those who shrink back under destruction, but we are those who persevere unto the salvation of the soul. Faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence, evidence of, of things, things unseen. not seen. So remember, we don't shrink back. Shrinking back, falling back, giving up, quitting, 
just letting it go. That's not who we are spiritually. That's not who we are historically. That's not who we can be politically. We must persevere for the salvation of the soul, our own and the salvation of the soul of this nation. Y'all, what we're doing now, this is the front end. The voting was first. And now we have to stay engaged. But with people like April Ryan, we're going to do just that because we are, about, we are in the big beginning of a third reconstruction in America to finish the undone work that should have been finished long.